So a lot of people will wonder what is an herbarium, and that's a lot of that's a really common question that I get as a curator. And herbarium is essentially like a combination of a natural history museum and library of plants, and it's really a documentation of the diversity of plant life on Earth. Uh, we have dried, pressed plants here uh, that are dried in the field and brought here by researchers from all over the world. Then they are glued to archival quality paper, and that helps preserve them. Uh, if it's done properly, these plants can last indefinitely. Uh, we have plants from Darwin, Captain Cook, uh, you know, in, or in Europe they have uh, herbarium specimens that are over 400, 500 years old. Uh, so it's really a documentation of the amazing diversity of plant life here. Uh, we have plants from all over the world, every single continent, basically every single country. So uh, when specimens are brought here, uh, they come directly from the field. And there's a number of ways that you can uh, collect an herbarium specimen in order to make it as scientifically valuable as possible. The main way that we do it is with a plant press. Um, it's basically uh, two pieces of lattice made from typically oak uh, with pieces of cardboard and blotting paper in between that creates sort of a sandwich that you put uh, herbarium specimens in between. And so I, as a botanist, when I'm out in the field, I'm constantly, constantly observing the plant life around me, making mental observations. Uh, and if I find something that's unusual, I would probably want to collect it to document that this plant is unusual. Maybe it's blooming at a weird time. Uh, it has a different color. It has a weird morphology about it. It's growing in an unexpected place. And so uh, what botanists do is we collect fertile samples, so uh, pieces of the plant that have flowers and or fruit, because those often have the best characters to identify a plant. Uh, we make sure they can fit on something this size, because that's the ultimate size of the paper that we store them in. Uh, and then we uh, cut them and we put them in between newspaper and put that newspaper in this herbarium press. Then the herbarium press is put over a heat source and the heat uh, dries out the plant, obviously, because moisture is really the enemy of an herbarium specimen. Uh, you don't want mold or you know, any sort of fungus or insect to get, it, to get in there. Uh, and sometimes, depending on the plant, uh, it can take just a couple of hours to dry. Or if it's something that's really succulent, it can take several days to dry, and you have to change out the newspapers and the blotting paper. Uh, and when you're in the field, sort of in the middle of nowhere sometimes, it can be quite challenging. Uh, and you sort of use whatever you have available. Uh, oftentimes, people will use kerosene uh, fires or maybe their cooking pit. Or uh, if you are so lucky as to have a car and you're in a really hot place, you can put the press in the car to dry it out. Uh, but basically, any way you can to get moisture out is how we do it. Uh, and then they are brought back here. Uh, to the New York Botanical Garden in the herbarium, and that's when we do our processing. Uh, oftentimes, botanists will collect in several duplicates per collection number, and that's essentially uh, insurance policy. If anything should happen to any one particular specimen, there's a duplicate of it that is somewhere else in the world. Uh, herbaria, like the New York Botanical Garden, uh, exchange specimens with each other all the time. The New York Botanical Garden is probably one of the best uh, places of its kind for botanical research in the entire world. We are the second largest herbarium. We have 7.8 million specimens here in the actual herbarium building. Uh, the largest one is the Natural History Museum in Paris. Uh, our plant diversity covers the entire world. Uh, we don't have a specimen of every species, but we probably have most of them. And that's something that we're actually trying to figure out right now. Uh, so for most of the history of the herbarium, we really had no good idea of exactly what we had. Uh, and over the last 20 years or so, we've actually been uh, digitizing our entire collection. So that provides a uh, online resource that is available to uh, high school students, researchers, college students, anyone free online. They can search our collections. And it also provides us with a catalog of exactly what we have. Um, some particular strengths of our collection is uh, focused on the Caribbean basin 
and uh, the Amazon as well, as well as sort of larger Brazil. And in fact, we probably have the best collection of Brazilian species anywhere, including in Brazil. Um, that's because the New York Botanical Garden has a really long history focusing on exploration and documenting plant life in Brazil. Uh, also, North America is extremely well represented, particularly Eastern North America, where, again, we've had a really long tradition of collecting, both at a local scale and a more regional. And then also the Intermountain West, sort of focused on the Great Basin area, so Utah, Nevada, Northern Arizona, uh, which is an area of really high plant endemism. A number of our researchers spent their entire careers collecting plants out there. We also have uh, really excellent collections that are in development right now, particularly focused on Myanmar, Vietnam, and sort of Southeast Asia in general, as well as Australia and a couple of nations in uh, the greater Pacific area. And our collection continues to grow every single year. Uh, we add about 30,000 new specimens every single year that are newly collected and brought here. Uh, and uh, every year new plants are discovered. Uh, sometimes in the field, but we also discover new plants here in our collection that may have been sitting in the collection for 100 years, but no one really paid close attention to it. Uh, we also provide loans to other institutions that other researchers who can't come here can use our collections in, our, in their own research. So the New York Botanical Garden has about 7, 8 point million specimens. And one question that I get asked a lot when I'm giving tours or talking to people about this is why? Why do you have 7.8 million specimens of dried, dead plants? Uh, and, you know, there is some, some wonder to that. But really, it's to document the diversity of life, the really amazing diversity that evolution has produced in, in terms of plants. Uh, also, the herbarium is also used to document the uses of plants. So uh, whether it's for clothing, food, uh, structures, um, you know, documenting what plants actually look like is actually very important. Documenting where they occur is really important. Uh, we also have the wild relatives of all of our major crop plants, which uh, in, an area, in an era of you know, continued climate change and evolving diseases can be really important in uh, selecting new crops or improving the crops we have. We can figure out what their wild relatives are, maybe go back, uh, collect seeds of those to use in future breeding programs. Uh, it's also really important to document just overall diversity and it's, uh, herbarium specimens are really important in conservation. So we figure out uh, when a plant was occurring in a set place at a set time. So that, uh, you know, if I want to figure out uh, how the orchids of New York are doing, I can look into the herbarium, which is essentially a time capsule, and I can go back 200 years, if not more, and figure out what orchids were occurring in the New York City area, and then compare that to today, and figure out uh, when particular species may have gone locally extinct, uh, where uh, there are super rare species here at one time which aren't occurring here, and are there new species that might be uh, occurring, whether they're migrating from other areas further south or west, or are they introduced species from elsewhere in the world. Um, also, a lot of our specimens are actually used for pharmacology. Uh, you know, originally all of our medicines came from plants, and uh, a lot of the synthetics that we use were originally based on plants. So a lot of our specimens are also used for uh, vouchers in medical research, whether it's for heart disease or cancer or uh, other new medicines. Um, people are going out all the time to try and find new plants that they can use in our research. And when they publish on the potential efficacy of that medicine, they use our specimens as vouchers. Uh, another aspect of herbarium specimens that's really come into development over the last 10, 20 years is their use in genetic research. So figuring out how the amazing diversity of plant life is all related to each other. And uh, maybe using that to figure out how we can conserve species better, how we can document species better. Um, so oftentimes, uh, if you dry a plant properly, the DNA inside of it is actually intact and can be extracted in the lab. And uh, the herbarium has really sort of uh, revolutionized the, the use of uh, phylogenetics uh, because we have plants here that are extremely difficult to recollect. 
So if you're studying uh, you know, a group of Amazonian palms, rather than trying to get all the permits that are necessary to do field work in Brazil and then bring the specimens back here, you can actually go into the cabinets and sample the specimens that we have, which are probably representative of essentially every single species of palm that grows in Brazil. Uh, you can also document hidden diversity. So if an area is developed, there may be extinct plants that no longer occur in the wild. And so we may actually have specimens of them here in the garden. So uh, you may be wondering, you know, where am I? I'm actually on the third floor of the steer herbarium of the New York Botanical Garden. Again, the uh, second largest herbarium in the entire world, the largest in the Western Hemisphere. And right behind me, this is actually where we keep our specimens. Uh, when we built this building about 20 years ago, we put in these compactor systems to help save space. And uh, so they are essentially giant filing cabinets that are full of shelves, and we keep our specimens in folders. Uh, and we are able to move them by rolling the compactors along, which helps save space. Uh, this particular building has no windows to ensure the specimens don't get sun damage. Uh, sun can be extremely damaging to archival specimens. It can bleach them and degrade them, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and all, the lack of windows also keeps out insects, moisture, things like that. Uh, the building is also air-conditioned down to about 70 degrees, and that's to uh, make sure fungi don't uh, start growing and also insects don't start growing. Uh, there's a number of insects that really, really like to eat uh, dead plants. Uh, some of them like to eat the glue that we use to glue the specimens to the plants, and uh, a lot of them like to eat pollen, and so they actually eat up the, the reproductive parts of the specimen, which are sometimes the most important parts of the specimen. Uh, so that's why we really invested to make sure uh, this building was as good as possible for preserving these specimens. So, uh, you know, an herbarium, one of the major purposes of an herbarium is to document the diversity of plant life. And, you know, and when you're walking around, you may notice plants come in a lot of different forms, a lot of different shapes. And uh, not all of them are the easiest things to make into an herbarium specimen. So uh, things that are in the sunflower family, like asters or sunflowers themselves, or in the snapdragon family, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, not very succulent. They don't have very much water in them. Uh, their flowers are relatively easy to press. And they make very nice specimens. Uh, sometimes things like lupins or uh, buttercups also make really nice specimens. There's not much water in them. And their flowers aren't too complicated in terms of the structure. Uh, oftentimes, uh, things like oaks or maples also make very nice specimens. Uh, other things, though, are a little bit more challenging to make into herbarium specimens. So the group that I study, orchids, are very challenging to make into herbarium specimens. Their flowers are very, very complicated in terms of their structure. They don't really squish very well when you put them into a press. And orchids often have a lot of moisture in them, so it can be very challenging to dry them out. Uh, the same thing is also true of cacti. So, uh, you know, cacti come in these amazing, you know, 3D shapes with spines all over them. They have giant flowers, giant fruits. Uh, and so when you put one into a press, you essentially have to skin it. You have to scoop out all the juicy inside. And you basically just leave a shell of the outside of the cactus. And then, of course, the spines stick through the newspaper and into the cardboard, and it's a huge mess. So one way you can get around that is by preserving specimens in alcohol. We call these spirit collections. So here I have a specimen of a cactus fruit, as well as some flowers. Uh, and actually, they cut the fruit open to uh, allow researchers to look at the seeds inside. This uh, not only uh, preserves the three-dimensional shape of this particular plant, but it also allows someone to look at the cells of this plant, look at the vascular system of the plant if they want, which for cactus, you often lose when you dry it and press it.